Welcome to a special edition of Conversations with Kate in service of Bangladesh and this time through sight. Today we have the esteemed Nobel Prize winner, Professor Muhammad Yunus, as our special guest. It's very unlikely, excuse me, but for those of you who may not know, Professor Yunus spent his entire career in service committed to rooting people out of poverty. Decades ago, he saw in Bangladesh, he saw a need in Bangladesh, excuse me, he wanted to empower communities as their own agents of change. And by the mid seventies, he started off by giving small personal loans to basket weavers. This would become the blueprint for microfinance as we know it today. And since then, uh, Mohammed Yunus through the Grameen Bank has advanced the forefront of eradicating poverty through micro lending in over 100 countries. We're really honored that Professor Yunus um, has a really special connection with SEBA. Uh, when we first started our work in Bangladesh, Professor Yunus was our very first partner. So for close to two decades, we've worked closely to establish new hospitals, innovative training programs, perfect the training programs, bringing sustainable systems of eye care for communities throughout the country. So it's really without fear of exaggeration that Professor Yunus has changed the lives of millions of people in Bangladesh now and forever. And we're transforming millions more, but this time through sight. Uh, you're known as a banker to the poor. He's a Nobel Prize winner. His accolades go on and on, but to say that he's a friend. He's a collaborator, he's an inspiration, and I wanna thank him very much for joining us today. So before we begin, uh, just a few quick reminders. Yeah, there'll be a QA and a question and answer box in our chat below, and we'll be engaging with you. So please put your questions there. And then there will be a recording that we send to you sometime after today. Well, thank you very much to be with you, Kate, and uh, getting back with Seva. We've been uh, great friends together for more than two decades now. We have done lots of good things. I hope good things people <laughs> appreciate uh, and uh, things that uh, we wanted to do and having fun doing it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing that uh, you can reach out to people uh, to address the problems they face in a day-to-day -day way. Uh, while uh, we were uh, talking about the lending money, it's uh, something that we did way back, nearly 45 years now. Uh, to save people from the loan sharks. So that's how it all began. I started lending money from my own pocket uh, to protect people from the loan shark. That was the only ambition I had at that time to, to how to protect people from the loan sharks. In the village, just for a few people. No, it's not a grand doys plan or anything. It's a personal thing. All I wanted to do was to make myself useful to other people. And I was looking for a way how to do that. And I was complaining that I've learned a subject called economics, which makes, made me totally useless. I have, been, I have no use to anybody. So I can only talk about things, which I don't know how it helps people. But as a person, I'm not reaching out to anybody to see, uh, to address the problem. So that's the beginning of it. And over time, I struggled with many issues. I complained about the design of the banking system as a, as a whole. And I started talking about uh, the credit should be taken as a human right. You don't debate about it, whether you want to lend money to poor people or not. It's, it's, a, it's like any other human right, right to food, right to shelter, right to education, and so on. So it's not about debating about it, it's a question of uh, providing it uh, without any debating. So I put uh, access to credit in a very high position, so fundamental to human being. So that's where it starts. So I challenged the entire banking system. Then I started challenging the economic system as a whole. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a design in a very wrong way. I said the very fundamental of economics, like it says, uh, all human beings are driven by self-interest. Uh, that's a basic assumption on which entire theoretical edifice of the economic theory is built on, assuming that human beings are selfish beings. I said, that's a thoroughly a wrong idea. Human being may be partly selfish, but there's a whole, entire human being is not a selfish person. It's a mixture of things, not totally 100% isolated and uh, being the selfish person. 
as a human being are driven by self-interest partly and partly by collective interest. And economics doesn't have any room for collective interest. If they leave it to uh, government, to leave it to NGOs, they leave it to somebody else. Because as a, uh, as a economic person, you cannot handle it because you're busy making money for yourself. So economists looked at human being as some kind of money-making robots. So in that picture, they squeezed out all the human elements from hum human being. I said, we are human because we have some human aspect to it, some human features. To it. Uh, we are touched by other people's life. We want to be selfful to other people. We want to jump in uh, to save people, uh, to address the problems, common problems of people. Economics doesn't have that those things because they don't they are not interested in common interest they're interested in self-interest so I said that's not suitable for human being at all uh, then I get into other issues of economics so saying that uh, look at this uh, global warming we keep talking about all the time it's, uh, it's getting worse and worse it's not getting better I said the whole global warming is the creation of the economic system that we built. Because it's not coming from some superpower, some not God, God has not ordered that the global warming should be on uh, and put all this pressure on the human beings and so on. No, it's God has not played any role in it. It's the role of us as a human being. We did something every day to create a situation where we made this planet unlivable. And as a result, uh, we are now counting days when the time is over for human beings. Uh, so I said, uh, we are talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming, which is a kind of a red zone. After that, this planet will not be a livable planet anymore and it's approaching very fast and we're talking in uh, all the cops cop latest is cop 26 how to push it further down where the scientists are saying you have hardly one decade or 10 years to reach that 1.5 degrees Celsius. so close so in a way i try to um, explain to people and uh, to myself also uh, that we are uh, living in a burning house. The house is burning. But the strange thing is inside the house, we are having celebration. We are having parties, enjoying ourselves. Without paying attention, the house under which ro roof we are living is burning away. So I said, that's the stupid thing that human being can do, making itself most endangered species on the planet because of his own doing. So when I put this together, I said, uh, it's not only global warming alone. There are many other things we have done in a very bad way and coming to bring an end to us uh, collectively. One is the global warming, which is coming very fast. Uh, and the other one is wealth concentration. All the wealth of the world is concentrated in extremely few hands. Uh, and the rest of the people don't have any any wealth at all. So at least uh, you can see that uh, uh, where uh, in the pandemic period, it became very vivid because we have been hearing how people lost their jobs, how lost their food, lost their livelihood during at the very beginning of the pandemic and stayed there. They couldn't get back to their life once again. While millions, even billions of people lost their jobs and income and uh, sustainability for their life, then the same period, two years, 2020 and 2021, a um, handful of super rich made $11 trillion of additional wealth. So you have uh, in the two-year period, it's not a long period, it's a very short period. Uh, while a group of people made it $11 trillion for themselves, and the remaining people, billions of people, lost everything that they had. So this is the way our economic machine is running. I said global warming is a creation of our system, 
and wealth concentration is also a creation of our system. So we, and with the way it's continuing every second, it's wealth is moving in one direction to the super rich, leaving the bottom people uh, where they are. They cannot improve their livelihood. Or if it does, it's a very insignificant way they do it. I said, that is uh, not something which will keep us alive, keep us sustainable. The last one that I complain about is the artificial intelligence. I said, occasionally we talk about it in a, in a, in a mood of celebration. Uh, we talk about fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we get very pr proud of it. This fourth industrial revolution is coming because machines will do everything. Human beings will be out of any work because they have no place to work. Because the machines will do better work and that's what the artificial intelligence is all about. It will continue to improve their work as they go by because of the machine learning and all the things. So what happens to human being? I said, look at the way we have created the economic system where human beings are turned into garbage on this planet because they have no use for themselves. I said, that's not the kind of world that we want to live. And it, now we come to the last stage. I said, we are on a suicidal path. We don't have much time left. Uh, now we have to be desperate to get out of it. And uh, if we continue with the old way of thinking, old way of doing, by going to the old roads, we end up in the old destination. And old destination is destruction, finishing ourselves off. I said, if you have to survive, we have to go to a new destination. We cannot go to the suicidal path. So we have to go to a new destination. And in order to reach that new destination, we have to build new paths, new roads. Old roads will not take us to the new destination. So we have to build a new destination and we have to build new roads to get to the new destination. And I define that new destination as a provisional path or, or the provisional destination. You may bring more ideas into it. I said, to me, it will be a world of three zeros. It's a counter to the world that we have created. We created global warming. This will be the zero global warming. We have created wealth concentration. This will be zero wealth concentration. We have created artificial intelligence and massive unemployment. This will be zero unemployment. So these are the three zeros I talk about, that we have to dream about it and imagine about it. If we dream about it, we can will happen because then we have to find a way how to build this uh, destination, how to reach that destination. Zero global warming or zero net carbon emission, if you call it, or zero and also additionally zero wealth concentration and zero unemployment by turning all human beings into entrepreneurs, not job seekers. So that's the direction we are talking about. And I said, I said old generation will not be able to solve this because their mind is filled with old ideas. And old ideas would simply drag us in the same road. So we need a fresh ideas, a fresh thinking. And that's where the young people comes in. So I focus on young people. Uh, I said, this is your responsibility now to build a planet for yourself because you don't have much future left. Older generation is out, they have their life but you don't have any life left. Your children will not have any life at all. So it's a very small opportunity, a window of opportunity. So you have to make sure you can create the 3 zero world. In order to get them preparation, I recommend to them, start creating 3 zero clubs and make it very small so that you don't have to debate about it. You just get together. Five young people get together and create three zero clubs. So I'm inviting them to create three zero clubs, make a new three zero world a reality. I'll stop here. I think we could listen to you forever. <laughs> and I think it's a, it's a, uh, I think that's part of why you very deservedly received the Nobel Prize back when you did. I think what you're, the way that you have seen the world, Professor Yunus, is you you've used science and then layered in a compassion for humanity and a, and then not being afraid to ask that tough question of what if it just looked different? And I think that's something that, you know, the Seva 
the founders of SEVA probably share with you, bringing science, but also layering in compassion and humanity. SEVA means, it's a Sanskrit word for selfless service. And um, I, I know that the team and our board are very uh, uh, proud of the fact that we began the work with you back in uh, 2006. And I want to talk a little bit about some, so the world that you're, that we're you, both working can, towards. Can I, can I stop you? You you have the wrong word, SEVA, because economics doesn't recognize it. <laughs> there is nothing <laughs> called selfless service. <laughs> See, <laughs> you are anti-economics. <laughs> economics has to be something you make money out of it. So that's, I said, we live with this idea and we don't feel uncomfortable about it. We, we yeah. teach our students, we teach our uh, children, you go ahead and make money, it's a good thing to make money. Forget about everything else. Anyway, I'll just stop. No, this if is I, what we want. What, well, describes um, what I'm talking about. Right. Well, well, then let's talk a little bit about some of the work that we do with you, which I think is beginning to turn some of those economics on its head. You know, you talk about social businesses and uh, not profits don't quite have the formula, right? but there's a similarity about taking profits and using it towards people. Um, let's talk a little bit about the need in Bangladesh, where 7.65 million people live to either with moderate or severe uh, vision impairment. And when I think about this term, I have to put it in uh, something more contextual. So that's that's almost the entire population of Paraguay in uh, living with uh, vision exactly. impairment. Right. Yeah. So I think one of the wonderments that we have is like if we're going to be able to 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 kind of introduce a new uh, a new world of three zeros uh, and solve a problem, you know, obviously I'm curious about how you see vision and its connection to helping to benefit Bangladesh in particular. But maybe we can talk a little bit about vision centers since that's a I wonder about the space that that work has inside of your future uh, building blocks towards a three zero world. You see, once you get into one of the things that you see wrong and you try to fix it and you get yeah. involved with it, uh, and then you see the other one is also wrong and you want to fix that too. So it's yeah. it, all things are interrelated. These are not isolated. I do lending and that's it. I don't do anything else. I do lending for a purpose, to change the life of the people. So life of the people is a, a huge system. So you touch one part and you touch another part and you see, we must do something here because it's so terrible. And that's what happened to us. When I was lending money in the village, in the beginning, I, was, I knew you every, every family, every person that I lend money to, they're very close to me and I took my students with me so that they know and I asked them to write their life history. This is one essential part of my class that they will go and write down in detail the life history of the poor person and how, where she was born, those earlier memories and with the families and all the trouble that they have gone through so that people understand their life, not just a person, is accumulation of an entire experience that he, she, she, she has gone through the entire life uh, as she grew up. So we want to understand that. So I knew them. So while I was doing that, one of the many things started noticing is what this poverty is all about. Poverty, it's lack of income is one, but there are so many other things that are still. One thing which hit me very hard right away, at very, very early stage. Uh, every home I visit, every place I meet in person, I see the children suffering so much. One basic suffering which didn't make any sense to me, I understand not having food, not having income and skipping meals and so on. But this one, I had no idea. They go blind at night. They cannot see anything. I was shocked that children go blind at night. I have never heard of this. And I was wondering, what is this about in this village? I thought this is a something, affliction in this village. It may not be in other villages. So I, wo I was worried. I went to the doctors, my friends. I described to them, this is what the situation is. Is it some kind of a disease spreading here or just uh, uh, they will lose their eyes or something? The doctors were very casual, so no, oh, don't worry about it. This is a, this is a problem with the eyes. If you, if you cannot cure it, ultimately, of course, your children will go blind. I said, what is it? 
Well, it's in uh, town, in medical terms, a night blindness. I said, well, that describes what I'm talking about, night blindness. At night, they don't see anything. Is there a cure? Oh, very simple cure. The body is a vitamin A. They should take vitamin A. That's about it. There's nothing else. It's a deficiency of vitamin A. I said, so simple. I said, yeah, this is so simple. Then why don't they become um, cured? I said, nobody cares. Vitamin A is just all you have to do, just get some vitamin A tablets and give it to them. And they will have the vitamin A and the eyes will be as good as new. And the children, little kids. I said, is it that simple? It's still they cannot get the eyes. It's an essential part of human beings. It's a learning and seeing and it's a feeling and so on. And I said, well, there is a still simpler thing. Not only you, have to, you don't have to buy those tablets. Uh, vegetables have plenty of vitamin A. So if they eat vegetables, which is plenty around, Bangladesh is fertile soil, grow vegetable, feed that the children eat, and it will be done. I was shocked with so simple solution. So in the beginning, I tried to get some uh, tablets because people don't get to the tablets. And, and it's in, they don't want to buy it, they have to spend money. I didn't want to give them free, so it didn't stop. So what I said, why don't you grow vegetables? I tried to promote vegetables so that they can eat vegetables. Well, then they said there is no seed, we don't know where to get it. and So, so I thought I should do something. I started buying seed myself. And the best quality seed as, as, as can be procured in Bangladesh and made small, tiny little packets. Each one is one penny. It cost only a penny for it. Several seeds and one penny packets. I said, let them use one penny to buy a packet or they can buy 10 packets for 10 penny if you want. And the sprinkle around. Don't tell me you don't have land. You sprinkle around any soil you see. And nobody will stop you there. And all you have to do in a few days, just pick them up and feed yourself, your children, and so on. So this became a part of our work, as every time our staff, the Grameen staff, will go out to meet the people, they'll carry bundles of those uh, seed packets and sell them, whoever wants, not only Grameen borrowers, non-borrowers also. Uh, it took time for them to understand, but they get, become very interested in it because they get very fresh vegetables. Beautiful vegetables. They never saw such beautiful vegetables in their life, the seeds they had. Uh, as our Grameen Bank expanded, our seed business expanded. It's one penny, so nobody cares. And you get so much food, vegetables. And children loved it, everybody loved it. Uh, Bangladeshi have lots of cooking style, how to make vegetables into porta. That's a smashed kind of thing. And everybody loves that fresh vegetable. So, uh, it, so our vegetable business grew. Uh, at one time, we became the largest vegetable seed seller in the whole country. I repeat, we became the largest vegetable seed seller in the country because everybody wanted it and nobody gave it to them ever. So I said, oh my God. And we are not losing money, we're covering costs. All we have to do is to do as many seeds as we want, we can give it because you are paying for us. So we did that. And we have a plenty big uh, working force in Grameen Bank, so we can spend it to any village we are working. And it's not only Grameen borrowers buying, non-borrowers are buying. This is such a simple solution. And a few days as Grameen Bank became a large bank, by that time, night blindness disappeared in the whole country. You go to Bangladesh today or even 10 years, 15 years, 20 years back, You'd say, what is, do you have night blindness? People will look at you not knowing what you're talking about. What is night blindness? Because it is such an unknown thing. In Bangladesh of my time, 50 years back, it's everyday time, every village sickness. Today, it doesn't exist anywhere in Bangladesh. So this, this is how we came to one after another. Then we got into other things. The healthcare, broader healthcare. Mother is sick. Is it? If you are poor, you are poor in health. It goes together. So mother is the sickest person in the family. She has all kinds of diseases. So what do we do? How do we handle it? Vegetable is one thing, but healthcare is something much bigger. So we scratched our head. We came up with the idea of introducing healthcare insurance. Imagine insurance 
never heard of it. People don't understand what insurance is. We say we'll give you a loan to start a business. We'll give you insurance to protect yourself. How do we design it so that people can pay attention to it? They have to pay in advance before anything happens. So it's a very tricky subject. We make it as low as possible in price. We said it takes only $4 per month. $4 per month for the entire family, for any disease. We take responsibility of all your diseases, all your health problems and so on. It was a very unpopular subject for them. Who wants to pay $4? It's a lot of money for them. And I don't get sick. The idea of sickness in the poor is completely different. They said, I never get sick. Why should I pay $4? My family never gets sick. To them, sickness means lying flat on the bed and not being able to stand up. And you miss your everything. You can't work. You don't, that's your sickness. But I, they force themselves to stand up and do because circumstances force them to do that. So they say, I'm not sick. Why should I do it? So it took a long time, but gradually start working. And we opened it up for non grameen borrowers, made it a little expensive, made it $6 for them, where $4 for grameen borrowers. And you can pay over time. You don't have to pay at a time. And today we have 140 healthcare centers under these uh, uh, healthcare system, uh, healthcare insurances. They are covered, they have their cards, they have annual checkup, everybody's entitled to annual checkup. We push them to come in, go there and to an annual checkup. They don't understand what checkup means, what, what we have to do, checkup for every family member and so on. Anyway, so we created healthcare. Then we started creating other healthcare uh, uh, programs and so on. That's where we came to save a long time, much later stage. Uh, we wanted to make it in a more systematic way, in a larger way, now that we have a healthcare system, now that we have the healthcare centers around the country, to how to create a uh, eye care hospital. Because we came up with eye care hospital, we are inspired by Arvind. That's a story I heard, read about it and met them and uh, visited Arvind. They were very kind, showed me everything, debated with them, discussed with them. I said, my God, they have done, they have all the answers. Why don't we kill, create eye care uh, hospital to do that? And that's where you come in and to supporting it, the whole idea, and the training and everything. And we created our first eye care hospital in Bogra. At that time, we had no knowledge. We sent all our people to be trained in Arvind. And you came up with the further training and so on, continued. So we feel strong because we have, I had nothing to do with medical service. I had no understanding of it. So I, I know that now you, Seva, brought those technical knowledge and uh, understanding of how to design it and so on, and uh, with the examples of uh, uh, Arabin. And we felt bold and do that. And then there's the first hospital built. And it was so exciting experience for us. Because at that time, when we were building a uh, care hospital in uh, Bogra, People in Bangladesh, if you have any eye problem, you have to come to Dhaka city because that's the only place you can treat people. So bulk of the population never had the opportunity to come to Dhaka for eye care. And it, people accepted that. If you have a problem with the eye, they will, very natural, they will have very natural explanation. The natural explanation is if you grow old, you get weak and your eyes see less. This is part of aging. So well, how can you de debate with uh, aging? This is a God-given thing. You age, you can't walk clearly, you can't work uh, as, as smartly as you used to do. So everything slows down and I slows down. They never knew the science does the same thing. You know, they can make this eye as new as ever. All it needs is a tiny little incision, night and operation, that's it. So I, we have been explaining to them, look, it can be done. And this took a long stay, stretch of understanding that we can do that. Those who are coming to Dhaka previously, we said you can do it in Bogra, nearby, you know, whoever around, you come here. So that was the beginning. What surprised us, Bogra Hospital came to break-even point in four years. 
We had no idea that we were gonna, we always insisted that it would be social business, it has to cover its cost, but we didn't realize that it could, can do that in such a short time. So that was excitement for us. Yes, you can run your eye care hospital and it can come to the break even point. And then once we understood that it can, and then we started talking to you, can we have a second one? And after lots of calculation and also we have support from Seva and, uh, and Arvind, we said, let's go and do it in Burisha, very difficult place in the South. And Burisha came out as a beautiful hospital. We designed it uh, much better than we did in uh, Bogra. And it came into less than four years, it came into break even. Oh my God, you can do that. So if you can do break even so early, let's do another one up in the north. Once in the middle, another is in the south. Now we go to, then we did the Tagulgan, another beautiful hospital, much better, much wider. Then the last one in Shatkira, again it's south. So we now have four eye care hospitals. And as you, logic is very simple, economics is very simple. Each one will be earning money surplus. Now that they have break even, they will be creating surplus. You collect all the surplus and build another one. And then you have five. You collect the five surplus and build another one. And you build six. Then you have collect all the surplus, build a seven. So you can a string of eye care hospitals. Now we have four. Satkira came out very recently, less than a year now, but is doing very well. Now already our staff is so excited. They are planning for eight total eye care hospital because it, they are paying for itself. We don't have to bring money from anybody. All we need training. Training is the thing which is missing for us. We need a very high quality training and we're very grateful to Seba for providing that. And then you gave the idea of vision center. I love that idea. You don't have to build the whole hospital. It's a simple place and they can do the neighborhoods and go on. And, uh, and that's it. You bring eye care close to people by doing that. And this is what we did. So we have done now four eye care hospitals. And again, Seva came in for training, for training and gave us the money for each one of them. Uh, so we have four. Then we saw that this, each one of them can come to the break even point as it's usual in four years. So again, if you have the four coming to break even point in four years, then you collect the surplus after that, build the fifth one, build the sixth one, build the seventh one. So it's a natural progress of doing, but the critical thing is uh, training, training people so that you don't make, make a mistake in your work. Uh, you can't uh, accept that. And also make sure quality is absolutely high quality. So that that's what, so widening the scope of vision center, eye care hospitals, uh, logically, it's very simple. The moment you accept the idea of social business. Social business is a business to solve problems, not to make money. So we are not interested in personally making money. We are interested in creating surplus to replace and also expand, use that money to expand. So you have an expand, exp expansionary system, self-expansion system making that. The key is the persons, doctors, nurses, and the paramedics, all the people that work in the MLOP and all that. These are the people. And uh, I'm very, very happy that uh, it worked out. And all you, you always gave us the courage because we are, such, we are always cautious because we don't want to mess it up because you can do wrong things in healthcare very easily and, and the entire community will be up against you because you have done something terrible to people in the name of treating them. So we are very careful and gave us that you gave us the uh, courage and the training to make sure that uh, that in, uh, accidents don't happen uh, easily. Yeah. So that's how we opened the eye care hospital. Now we can see that we can have a series of eye care hospitals all around the country, series of vision centers all around the country.
you know, several of the people that were shoulder to shoulder with you back in the day. I think David Green is on the line this morning. Mr. Nagarajan and Tulsi are all, I'm wow, noticing them in the, on the list of the participants. And, and just for those in the audience that may not know, what Professor, Professor Eunice is talking about, an ISL program that, you know, this is a shared success story. Um, it's when we go into hospitals and local communities. It's world-class training um, to help um, an eye care professional who's going to end up providing training to someone else. It's a trainer of trainer program. And the Grameen Health Health, you know, the Grameen um, Healthcare Services, you you actually helped us to build it and successfully prove that it can be a blueprint to take around the world. So this is a you know kind of a shared uh, moment of of. Uh, selflessness and learning, and and I think an, uh, a really unbridled um, commitment to having a preferential option for the poor, and that that's a very different way of sort of thinking about work and 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 seeing it less paternalistically. Um, so it just really fills my heart uh, to know how we've been working together. I think we have a few more minutes left, and then I want to open it up to some questions that might be coming in from others. I think you know I can't, I would be remiss, you know. So the building blocks you've had this. Um, incredible arc and through line, Professor Yunus, of justice, social justice, um, businesses that are committed to social good. And we've talked about the work at SAVE with the training, the vision centers, the self-sustaining. But let's talk a little bit about equity and gender equity, especially since Women's uh, International Women's Day is coming up. And I know that it's been a big uh, component to, uh, you know, your personal work and the work of, uh, that we've done with um, SEVA. So I'm just curious um, from your perspective to describe how the situation for women in Bangladesh has over um, evolved over the last several decades and, and how the solutions like Ramin or SEVA are continuing to uh, empower women as, as agents of their own change. Well, the Grameen became known for its strange way of doing things. One of the strangest things we do, we lend money to women. And we did it very deliberately in a very early time, uh, back in mid-70s. That's why we insisted that we lend money to poor women. And why did we do that? Why this idea came to my mind to begin with? When I started doing the personal loan, personally giving loans to poor people, uh, at the time, mostly men. And I ran into controversy with the bankers. I was accusing them that you do banking in a wrong way because uh, you uh, lend money to people who already have money and you don't lend money to people who don't have money. I said the real banking should, by the way, you should be lending money to the poor people who don't have money. And after you have done that, you should be lending money to people who already have money. So it would be the last priority not the first priority. First priority should be. They laughed at me. I said, not only that, look at you, how strange way you work in your banking system works. You don't lend money to women. Not a single woman benefit from your lending. Even the rich women, they immediately cried, shouted and said, no, that's not true. We give a loan to anybody who can afford it, who can give the collateral, who has enough uh, black... Uh, uh, the, the wealth uh, to give us the collateral. Uh, so we give that. I said, no, I checked all your records, all the banks, not even 1%. I said, I can show you, I have the records. Not even 1% of all the borrowers in the country happen to be women. How do you justify that? You are talking about the poor are not credit worthy and all the things that you are accusing them of where I'm saying that the poor should be accusing you for not being people worthy because you don't know how to do business with people and you're not turning it around saying they're not very good. I said, you're not people worthy. And top of it, now you show that uh, even the richest women cannot get a loan because they are only 1%. What is wrong with you? And they said, uh, they are not asking for loan. That's why we don't give. I said, no, your system is wrong. Women come to ask for money for getting a loan. A rich woman she has money, she can take a loan, she wants to do business. You always tell her when she's bringing the proposal, have you discussed with your husband? Does he agree with it? Why did you bring him along so that we can discuss the business? As if she's not worth discussing business. So that's where you are eliminating them in the process. You're not 
saying by your law that we are not accepted. But here, this, this discussing, dismissing them by saying, bring the husband in the front. So we deal with the husband, not with you. Who are you? It's her money. So anyway, so I said, they said, well, if they're not interested, what they do? I said, you have to do it even if they're not interested. Create interest in them. Tell them this good for them. They couldn't care less. They just laughed it away. Then I made sure, why don't we do it ourselves? Why don't you go to women, say, take money and start a business? So my, I took the girls from my class to go to the women because I cannot go. I'm a man. I'm not supposed to talk to women. At that time, women means to stay behind the door. And she is the, is the last part of the house is allocated for women. They cannot come to the middle part of the house or the front part of the house. They cannot get out of the house. That's ultimate finish. You don't do that. So that's the kind of life the women had. There. For poor women, it's still more strict for them because they cannot stand out to fight this. So this is the scenario that we had at the time. And women said, no, I don't want to disturb my family. They were just upset with it. So it took a long time to persuade women. And we tell, I started telling my students, said, look, when they say, I don't want to take money, uh, I'm afraid of money, uh, don't walk away from them. This is the fear talking. See, years and years, generations of fear accumulated around them because they don't want to get out. Fear has blocked them out. So our job is to go repeatedly to them, explain how life can be different and start peeling off the fear layer by layer. Someday, we don't know how long, someday the real person will come out. If one of the women comes out of this layers and layers of fear and say, I should take the money, I'll try it out. And she tried and worked and everybody will be curious how did she do it. In the beginning, she will hate. She will be hated by everybody, but very soon she will be admired by everybody. She did that. She is a courageous woman, and they want to secretly do the same thing, and that will be the beginning of it. And it happened, and it became a global. Well, it became a nationwide thing, and we concentrated on women. The impact on women is fantastic, and we saw that they not only took the money, they made the best use of the money, made sure benefit of the money in the impacts on the family. Unlike the men, men always wanted to spend the money on himself and his friends outside the house. But women always wanted to do it inside the house to the children, to the husband, and to make sure the household is better place to live and so on. So we benefited from our side as a banking purposes and the society benefited these women become confident and started doing things in their own way. And the whole scenario of women in Bangladesh changed completely. And the transformation of women in Bangladesh, which started the whole revolution in Bangladesh, everything that happened in Bangladesh is because that women came out of their shells and took responsibility and said, we will change our lives. That's magnificent. Your work, uh, I was a, a young, well, not so, but young uh, uh, relief and development worker with another international multilateral organization. And your work was coming on the scene at the time, at the scene at the time where I, I think at the time I was in the Balkans during the war. And I remember it just blowing my brain open that you were taking something that I think had just been uh, taken as fact for so many decades and you were turning it on its head and then you were showing the the power, the power potential, right? And uh, and uh, I just want to thank you because that that work was explosive, and I think it changed the way we think about um, collaborating and working alongside of organ uh, countries rather than a paternalistic kind of colonial top down, just sort of unlocking the excellence within. And you know that's really what I think the vision centers give a place where the women that we're, we've trained actually have a place to work. It allows them to work before they maybe go into a marriage and earn some money for themselves. But it's also an access, right? Proximity. So what you did with the bank is similar to what the vision centers are doing with healthcare. It's a pro it's a proximity play. When people have access to something, we've shown that uh, individuals will will not only operate for their own best interest for their families, but for their community as well. It gives me goosebumps when I see the statistics of Grameen Bank. It lends right. out over two and a half billion dollars of loans every year now, 
two and a half billion US dollars worth of Bangladeshi currency every year. And they are repaid in full within limit, time limit, 97% plus percent of repayment within time. Uh, so this is something everybody knows about it, but the thing which is less known, they receive two and a half billion dollars a year. These women have bank accounts putting their savings as they go along. This is part of the Grameen system. Everybody has to pay, put a little bit of money every week in their savings account. And Grameen staff will collect it and put their accounts. They have collectively owe more than $3 billion in their savings account. The current savings account, the balance of it, is not someday accumulated. It's a balance amount that stays $3 billion to these women and they own the bank itself. These are missed out completely that the women has silently did something which nobody ever thought they're capable of doing. Well, I, I would be remiss if I don't take a minute to share like some of the some of the messages that are coming in for you. These are friends, these are people whose lives you've influenced, but also people that I think you know on a personal level. Um, Mr. Nagarajan wrote, it was so nice to see you, Professor Yunus, and here you Agreed. articulate the issues so well. And then you know, he thanks you so much for that. And, and Ruth Walker says it hits a chord for her. Her grandmother, who died in 1962 at the age of 75, complained that so many worship the almighty dollar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Professor Eunice, you've been, uh, you've changed the world and, and uh, you, there's a, there's, you're um, a beautiful brain and a humble spirit. And I really, like many of us who have read your work or listened to your speeches and, and participated in classes that you've sponsored, you know, you talk about creating a world without poverty and you um, you stated that the and I and forgive me because I, I like the quote is that the poor are like the bonsai tree uh, when you plant the best seed of the tallest tree in that six inch deep flower pot, you get a perfect replica of the tallest tree, but it's only inches tall. And then you then you push the imagination further to say how it's nothing wrong with the seed. Uh, it's about the soil base that you provide being, you know, either inadequate or limited. And poor people are like bonsai people. There's nothing wrong with their seeds, only society never gave them the base to grow. And I feel that you have been a champion of making sure that people have the space and the soil to grow. And I really wanted to thank you for the work that you do with SEVA and the work that you do in the world. And thank you for doing the wonderful work through SEVA. Without SEVA, we would not have the courage to do the things that we did. And we still plan to do so many things. We are on the way of doing, uh, we already have the nursing college and producing the best nurse in the country. Nursing college became the best nursing college within you know, 10 years. And now we expanded it. And we have digital healthcare system so that no matter where you are now that everybody has a phone, you can call up a doctor anytime, online healthcare services, so that you can talk to real doctors. You don't have to wait in line. You're, every time your call is answered because doctors are waiting for you. And all these conversations and, and all these records of your healthcare are in computerized system. You see, immediately you talk about and call it, call up. Uh, we have your uh, information, uh, healthcare information on the screen. We know what happened to you and what you, who you are and so on and so forth. So all these things, trying it out and trying it out, make sure we do that. We want to go further and further as much as we can. Well, we're, we're ready to go where you fall. We're, we're ready to follow where you go. Well, we will work together. Fantastic. We'll go together. Thank you. Well, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. For those that are on, we're going to, there are a few, we, Seva is famous for uh, having wonderful images from our work in the field. So we do have a couple of uh, images that we wanted to sort of close out this time together. It's with Professor Yunus and some of the staff that started the work in uh, Bangladesh back in 2006. But for those of you that are leaving, thank you for joining us today, Professor Yunus. Thank you. Thank you so thank very you. much. And, um, and, uh, we look forward. I look forward to seeing you in Bangladesh, and uh, I'm I'm actually Please. serious. I joked about it in the prep. I, I, I I'm bringing this, and I want a signature. <laughs> and we, we have to update on the book. Book was already. Oh yes, 
needs lots of updating. There's so many exciting things happening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye bye. So I think we have a nice uh, slideshow here for those of you that are staying with us. So this is our fantastic team. I think we spoke earlier about if I'm going to go ahead and I think when you look at the screen from um, right to left is uh, David Green. He is a, a current consultant with SEVA, but he's been instrumental in helping uh, SEVA with so many firsts, whether it's uh, the work that we've done with our lab or, or uh, uh, Aravind. And he continues to help uh, influence and inspire us on technology today. Dr. Suzanne Gilbert, she's a founder, a co-founder of um, SEVA Foundation. She's also in charge of helping us look at um, operational efficacy. So she's in charge of our research and development arm, and uh, she helps us sort of make sure that the programs that we do in the field are actually doing what we think they're doing. Obviously, Professor Eunice is the, next to uh, Suzanne. And then we have Mr. Nagarajan. And together with Suzanne, help to sort of frame not only the what we do of SEVA, but the how we do it. And it's something we call uh, the Global Site Initiative. And it's a values-based um, way of working that places um, emphasis on working with, uh, you know, the knowledge from the local communities. And then the person to his side is Dr. Asim Sill, and he's with the V-Man Hospital in Bangladesh. Next slide. Okay, and then I think here you'll see from left to right is Tulsi, he's the executive director of um, Aravind, and then you have Dr. Gilbert and Professor Yunus, and then uh, Suzanne and Dr. and Professor Yunus. So thanks for, thanks for sticking with us on this little uh, video, uh, kind of photo tribute to the staff and to the beginning and the origins of the work. Thank you for joining us. Keep this space. We look forward to seeing you again.